At one time, an American political party stood before American voters and presented a bold agenda. An increase in old age pensions, cost of living adjustments for veterans, slum clearance, and low rent housing paid for by the federal government. A well paid and efficient federal workforce. Federal funds for more hospitals and care for the mentally ill. Collective, not unilateral, national security using the United Nations and equipping the UN with an army. Equal pay, regardless of gender, with the submission of the Equal Rights Amendment. Who were these knee jerk liberals? It was the 1948 Republican Convention. And it's a very fair representation of their platform that year, but let's be fair, they did also say some of the standard GOP things you might be used to. They were for cutting government spending and helping small business. And that slum clearing stuff was only, only as a last resort if private enterprise couldn't do it, though a lot of slums weren't being cleared at the time by the private sector, so it's almost like saying the same thing. And the cost of all this stuff might not have been as top of mind in the 1940s as it would be now. But in great detail, the 1948 convention copied the liberal agenda. And that was fine with its candidate, Thomas E. Dewey. He wanted to be sure that he dodged the bullet that might slay him. President Truman's charges that if elected, he, Dewey, would kill the New Deal. In a sense, the platform didn't matter. Dewey was ahead in the polls. Truman wasn't highly regarded. The GOP owned the House and Senate. They won in a shocking 1946 midterm where they won 13 Senate seats and 50 House seats to take both bodies the first time since Hoover. So attack Truman, but don't scare Democratic voters who had pulled the lever for FDR four times in a row. Do that and Dewey wins. Yet this played into President Truman's hands because, as a memo from his aide Clark Clifford had charted out earlier in the year, in addition to a healthy amount of appealing to the special interest groups that made up the New Deal coalition, Clifford urged the president to make clear to the American people what he wanted the Congress to do. In the most plain fashion, wasn't going to get cooperation from Congress, but he would put himself in position, as Clifford urged, to take credit or call them obstructionists. I think you need to understand that President Truman was only vice president for a few months when FDR died. He was known in Washington. He had been a senator for 10 years. He was certainly known in Missouri at this point, but not well known outside in the rest of the nation. And as president, when he made speeches compared to FDR, he was less charismatic. And as he was running the country and not campaigning, he was making dull presidential kind of speeches. It was so bad that Walter Lippmann said, Truman's insistence on being nominated when his party doesn't want it shows the pomp and power of the presidency can turn humility into stubborn pride. And the dean of political journalists, James Haggerty of the New York Times said, the nominee of the GOP convention will be the next president. So given all these expectations, when he came out as fighting Harry in the 1948 Democratic convention, I think it made an impact. On July 26, which in Missouri we call Turnup Day, I am going to call Congress into session and ask them to pass laws to halt rising prices, meet the housing crisis, and support education, which they say they are for. And when he did call Congress into special session and Congress did not enact the entire platform of 1948 as they proposed, he was able to say it was a do-nothing Congress and run on that point. This is important. As Mark Murray asks on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics Facebook site, do you think President Obama will point much of the blame on Congress as Truman did in 1948? And if he did, would it resonate? Okay, well, great question, Mark. But uh, there are some reasons that I present that background because you can make that case of the do-nothing Congress, and I think presidents have a lot since Truman, but I think it's important to know about 1948 and that the GOP had handed Truman's rhetorical weapon over to him by putting out a platform that was similar in ideology to the president. So Truman could just say, OK, it's turn up day, do it. 
So I think it's a very different thing when it's a clear and well-publicized and well-stated ideological difference between the two parties. And as much as not all voters follow politics, I think they can get that. And there are enough partisans on either side making that clear in blogs. You will not have a Republican platform that is similar to the Democratic agenda. At least I don't think so. You know, but what he's not going to do is, and not able to do is what Truman did in a sense and say to John Boehner, okay, have a free shot on me. Put Congress in session and work on Romney's platform. Because I don't think President Obama is going to like Romney's platform. That's my guess anyway. I don't think it's going to involve, you know, health care and stimulus and the kind of things that Obama would like to see. Another problem is the Senate. Unlike Truman's 1948 situation, President Obama controls the Senate. Start calling it a do-nothing Congress and, you know, three fingers pointed back at the party of Jackson. You could say do-nothing House, well, you're losing a little punch there, and people know the Senate has a role, so it always can be blamed partially on that body. In Truman's case, the legislative branch was beyond his control by the time of his election. Third point I might make is that I would say 1948 is a poor comparison right now. I don't actually put Obama in as rock-bottom politically a position as Truman was. So playing the underdog might be tough because he's not there yet, at least in the eyes of the media or polls. He's not in the position that, that Truman was in. You know, one could look deeper into 1948, as some political scientists have, and question whether all that give him hell, fighting Harry, really was the decisive element. I think that it's fun political history. It's a great story. Campaigns and elections, it's, you know, historic. I think, though, it was all magnified in a way no other election will be by the fact that the media blew it so badly. They stopped polling. They started calling the election for Dewey early. But all through that year, there were some positives for the president. He had a 2% unemployment rate, where a lot of people thought coming out of World War II, the economy would sink again. That's what happened after World War I, and that was what was on people's mind. Inflation was bad, to be sure. There were wage and price controls, although that had its own grumbles that came with that. Truman also had a foreign policy that the GOP really couldn't disagree with, and most Americans agreed with at the time, his decision to move the United States more in a posture against the Soviet Union, our former ally. You know, we all think we know why an election was won, and the story of 1948 has become the train ride, and it certainly could have been a factor. This is the debate among political scientists, and some think that there's no meaning to campaigns whatsoever. The president's going to win on their record, voters are going to do what they're going to do, and the campaign's just a sideshow. I don't know about that. I think there's a factor, but we may be overvaluing how much it is. It could be just a small percentage. It could be a little bit of that media ricochet. You, you get out and have a good campaign, and the media starts uh, spinning you well. But it could have been that old-fashioned referendum election that occurs when a president seeks another term. Do people like the president's performance? In 1948, many did not, but enough did. And there's some evidence for this, that it wasn't so magic an election. If it was, this miracle overwhelming charm of the Whistle Stop Tour, his results in some states were anemic. California by half a percent, Ohio by a third of a percent, Illinois and Indiana by less than one percent. Adelaide Stevenson runs for governor of Illinois in 1948, same year as Truman, and doesn't benefit from the Truman ticket. He outpolls him by 100,000 votes. So does Estes Kefauver running for Senate in Tennessee, and Hubert Humphrey running for Senate in Minnesota. A Democratic senator in Delaware wins while Truman loses the state. That's one of the reasons why Truman came in and wasn't able to get a lot of his legislation passed. The Congress was, we don't owe you anything. We carry you in, not the other way around. And indeed, the 1948 election would be the high point of Truman's presidency. It would go downhill from there. You know, one should be careful about that whole do-nothing Congress. It's a useful rhetorical point at times. But if you really look deeper into 1948, it's kind of like that 1916 election I was talking about. Everybody loves the comeback. Everybody loves the surprise win. But is that really where a president wants to hang their hat? For Napoleon in the early 19th century, he was hanging his hat on flattery to woo the new nation of the United States over to their historic alliance with France. Upon the death of Washington, the general, and at this point Republican leader of France, issued an order 
for ten days of mourning. Washington is dead. That great man fought against tyranny. He consolidated the liberty of his country. His memory will be forever dear to the people of the two worlds, and especially the soldiers of France. Napoleon ordered that a bust be made and placed next to Hannibal and Caesar. Foreign Minister Talleyrand issued a statement praising the United States as the wisest and happiest nation on the planet. And in the playhouses of Paris, the rage was a play called The Heroine of Boston, a pantomime about two American girls and their love affair with, you guessed it, two French officers, ruined by a diabolical British general. A decade later, as the British orders in council forbid neutrals from trading with Europe, and that meant American ships, Napoleon told the U.S. ambassador, you should answer with a cannon. Well, when we did just that several years later, the French papers praised the United States. Once again, the sword of Washington is drawn. In the playhouses of Paris now, a new play, The Reprisal of Washington, showed how this great leader built an army of innocent Quaker Americans who were being oppressed by the British and defeated them. A book became the hit of the Salons in 1813, Stories of Americans and Englishmen. It demonstrated how vile and oppressive the English monarchy was. But all of this propaganda aside, American ships had their problems with the French Navy too when they encountered them. In 1812, American merchant vessels flocked to the harbor at Bordeaux, away from the English Channel, where the blockade there was not as effective. Though they had little problem with the British Navy here, they were often detained by French authorities for months on some kind of technicality, like not having a license or papers that no one was aware of. Often they were refused the ability to sell their cargo. On the high seas, prior to 1812, the French had been seizing our ships, refused entry to their ports. Cargo was allowed to rot or seized as some kind of trumped-up contraband. Some years they had boarded American ships and seized anything that was British-made. There were lesser offenses that occurred throughout the early history of our two nations. They'd pick up American sailors in the U.S., you know, French merchant vessels, and then drop them in Bordeaux where they'd find cheaper crew. So you had American sailors stranded there, and it was a big diplomatic problem. A more serious issue was Napoleon's Milan Decree of 1807, which said that any vessel trading with the British was to be treated as British property and an enemy. Indeed, the French seized 558 American merchant ships, more than the less than 400 that the British Navy did prior to the War of 1812, according to a report Madison sent to Congress. It's no surprise, then, why a resolution of the Kentucky legislature and participants at a meeting in Charleston, South Carolina, political bigwigs, called for a triangular war against both Britain and France. Madison dreaded that. A war, he said, where we would have nowhere to base our ships. In his war message of 1812, President Madison lays out the case against Great Britain. And then he does mention the violations by France, which are still occurring despite all the praise coming from that nation for us. But he abstains at this time from recommending any move against this nation, without explaining much. But there were a few other reasons other than Madison's wisdom that 1812 didn't become a war against both Great Britain and France. By that time, the French Navy was bottled up by the British in the continent and couldn't terrorize the Atlantic waters. The British had cannons on our backs in the northwest of the country and Canada, and this would hamper our western growth in a way the French weren't, and the British were impressing our seamen a great deal more than the French Navy had. Kelly C. Ward writes, in response to the podcast I recently did on the 1812 war and the election, you mentioned that the French impressment of U.S. sailors was almost as much as the British. Any further insights? Also, how and why did letters of mark and reprisal work? Okay, well, we'll deal with that latter issue quickly. Congress has the power of the, in the Constitution to declare war, but it also has the power to issue letters of mark and reprisal. And you probably, when you read the Constitution, ask, what is that? Well, it's essentially legalized piracy. So if a nation does this, they are now providing refitted merchant ships or some pirate vessels out there with a letter from their government that allows them to raid the enemy. 
It's kind of a way of waging economic war using these privateers without needing a navy, which at the time of the early, early American history, which is where we were, had a very small navy. So, so a ship that had one of these letters of mark could actually injure British shipping, let's say, and not get questioned about it by U.S. authorities, and they could keep what they took. It was an act of war. If anyone questioned what they were doing, the letter of Mark would save you. It would not save you from the enemy, of course, if you were captured. The last thing they would care about is your letter of Mark from the United States. But it's an important thing to consider because President Madison and others had hoped that perhaps in 1812, the war hawks in Congress would just issue the letters of Mark and reprisal, and that would be it. His war message that I referred to earlier actually doesn't call for war at all. It mentions the British outrages and says we can't be passive anymore, but it refers this solemn question to the legislative department. Oh, and he says, the decision will be worthy. Well, he sent it to them, and Congress voted for war, and that's why we had war rather than just this piracy war in 1812. The Letters of Mark concept, I should point out, has been invoked recently by candidate Ron Paul, who says we should have used them in the War on Terror. We should have encouraged private armies and just issued such of these letters to hunt down the enemies of the U.S. rather than spend trillions. It's an interesting point that it's coming back. Uh, I think you can look in history and say that all of this Letters of Mark and privateering business wasn't uh, the most efficient way to wage war on your enemy. You are empowering a group of people who are under your sanction, but not under your control. And also you have to consider that whatever you're doing, other nations can do back to you. So it gets to be a messy business, and it certainly was, which is why I think as soon as possible, nations, including the United States, started developing real navies to protect their merchant fleets and to wage war. As to the French impressment of our sailors, I could have stated that better. It wasn't so much that the French were doing the same thing of the, as the British in terms of impressing our actual seamen, is that they were doing the same thing as the British in committing offenses on the high seas and taking what was our property and blocking our economy by blocking our shipping. So actually, in terms of impressment, the British were doing quite a bit more of that from what we can see. French were doing more of the seizing of ships. Impressment is a more emotional issue. You're actually taking someone often for a alleged term of five years, but it can even be more. It's virtual slavery. You might get paid something. The British considered Englishmen who went on American vessels to be subject to their a service in their Royal Navy. And at different times, they considered Americans on American vessels to be subject to that as well. Once an Englishman, always an Englishman was the Navy's unofficial rule. Even a natural-born American didn't you know, carry a card or anything like that. Officers often violated even the British Navy's own rules and were rarely punished for it. The most important thing is that the British needed manpower in their Navy. Press gang hits the American merchant ships in boarding parties, just like pirates, and would even go at some times to American ports and drag up anybody who had had too much rum and looked British. Small nation, big navy. They needed manpower. And the British had more of a need than France with its large population and conscription system. Every county in Britain had to supply a quota of sailors, and they raided the jails and the pubs as well in Great Britain. So it wasn't just Americans they were impressing. I think a good thing to understand is that impressment was part of both the British Navy and the British Army going back to the days of Queen Elizabeth and a Vagrancy Act in which anyone could be put into the army. So the Dutch and the French used impressment, but it was not as serious a problem as uh, France just seizing our ships, especially during the time of the War of 1812, where the French Navy was bottled up. James Zimmerman's 1966 book on impressment says that there was impressment of American seamen by the French. There can be little doubt, but there are few records of it. So I think I would... Uh, Go with that. The, uh, the actual impressment was, was more of a British problem. During the 1920s in the U.S. Senate, Vice President Charles Dawes walked over to a Kentucky senator and said, This is a hell of a job I have. All I can do is two things. Sit up here and listen to you birds talk without the ability to reply. 
and look at the newspaper every morning to see how the president's health is. Dawes' comments left an impression on the mind of Albin Barkley. But it didn't dissuade him from becoming vice president. It just encouraged him to change the office once he got there and change it in a way that is still present today. But how come today's TV vice presidents don't seem to reflect these changes, be it Julia Louise Dreyfus on Veep or the vice president of the West Wing? Why do they show vice presidents as different as the real way they are in Washington today? So ask Brett Miller. Watching the way Veeps are portrayed lately belies the partnership or lieutenant status of VP since Mondale. Yes, the writers for Veep are, I believe, about 70 years behind the times. I know they're making a joke, but it's a long way to go to make a joke. Vice presidents in the modern era make appearances on the part of administration and are credible in doing so. They go around the world. The transitional figure may have been this 70-year-old Kentucky senator named Albert Barkley, Truman's vice president. He didn't start with Hodge. He had that same kind of 19th century vice presidential office. He didn't get an office in the White House or the executive office building next door to the White House like Lyndon Johnson did in 1960. He used S-214, the vice president's room, the same Senate chamber that 19th century vice presidents used, where Garrett Hobart held court, where Henry Wilson died. He liked the room and took advantage of the fireplace that was there. Indeed, Barkley was still more a part of the legislative branch, using that other constitutional power of the vice president as the president of the Senate, presiding over the body about three-fourths of the time, a lot more than other vice presidents. He broke seven tie votes on a fairly high number and often would make rulings on the floor, which sometimes the senators overturned. But Barkley also decided that despite his age, he would do something different. He would raise the level of the VP. He took part in party meetings, cabinet meetings, group meetings with the president, not yet those kind of one-on-one -on -one lunches that you hear about today, but group meetings where the president was meeting with members of Congress. And he was the first VP to be a member of the National Security Council. This was big. Truman, as vice president, had been saddled with a national security secret of atomic proportions. Barkley was led into the NSC. And it was partially because of Barkley's status. He had been a senator for 20 years, 12 years as majority leader of his party. And he was not going to enter, as he said, a four-year period of silence. I enjoy people, and I like the thrill of crowds. He took every invite he could get, hundreds of them, spoke around the country, spoke at various meetings in Washington, even did his own TV show, Meet the Veep. So Barkley elevated the profile a little bit so that by the time you get to Richard Nixon, well, Barkley was going to the NSC meeting, so, so should Nixon. And Eisenhower let them in there, and he was allowed in cabinet meetings. This is a big deal. Both Coolidge and Hoover turned down their VPs when they asked to be in cabinet meetings. Since Eisenhower didn't care to campaign in midterms, Nixon was the voice of the administration during those political campaigns. When Eisenhower had a heart attack in 1954, Nixon quietly took over cabinet meetings and made sure that no other members of the cabinet took advantage of Ike while he was away. In 1959, Nixon was sent to the Soviet Union and met with Nikita Khrushchev. Pretty big deal. Now you have Veeps that are having weekly lunches with the president, offices in the West Wing, and a telling sign, since Walter Mondale, a house at the Naval Observatory, where Albin Barkley and the others had to get their own accommodations. Vice President Cheney was certainly the most powerful vice president and a key advisor. Alan Simpson says, you know, some of these notions are foolish. He never did anything that George W. Bush didn't want anyway, but obviously a force to be reckoned with in that White House. I see an increasing role for the vice president really since Mondale as an odd budsman. You see this in Al Gore. Walter Mondale, Joe Biden. You know, the vice president is the only man that works for the president, but the president can't really fire. Yes, they can drop them from the ticket, etc., but they have a constitutional link to their office that the president really can't sever. So I think that if it's the right person, they're able to kind of talk back to the president, tell the president what he doesn't want to hear but should hear. And you definitely see that role, at least in those three. There are some that are a little weaker. This linear progression of the vice presidency isn't always exact.
Did Dan Quayle really have that much to advise George H.W. Bush on? Was Hubert Humphrey really advising Lyndon Johnson? Lyndon Johnson himself, and I'm just reading the new uh, Carroll book right now about uh, his vice presidential years, was frustrated by the lack of access he got by the Harvard advisors in the Kennedy administration called Johnson. Rufus Cornpone Johnson said, every time I'm in Jack Kennedy's office, I feel like a raven hovering on his shoulder. Johnson uh, sent a memo to Kennedy asking him to have some control over various cabinet departments, overseeing them over NASA, and to get copies of all the documents sent to Kennedy. Kennedy just ignored the memo, though he did put him in charge as the chair of the space program. So it's not always exact. Not everybody's as tight with the president, obviously. I think some VPs are chosen for their appeal to some group of the president's party. So Hubert Humphrey, you know, his job was to cover the liberal flank for the party. I think Dan Quayle was covering the right wing for George H.W. Bush. But that kind of dynamic's not present with Biden, Gore, or Cheney. So I think they had a larger role in governing. So yeah, I think the portrayals are a little out of date. It is possible you could get a vice president like the Veep show who has no role, but it would be highly suspect these days because the media would continually ask the question, why isn't this vice president doing everything that Cheney did? You know, And it would be its own embarrassment on the administration. So what does this all matter? If you're looking at who Romney's going to pick, I'm going to do a podcast on this topic, but if you're looking at it, the choice of Romney, remember that it's got to be someone that he's going to be comfortable handing off projects to of real significance. No longer just visiting, you know, tiny Latin American nations, but going to visit some of the serious major players on the world stage and being really the president's lieutenant. Okay, Matthew Norman writes in the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics Facebook site, from time to time I have seen read, watched, heard articles where President Obama was referred to as Mr. Obama. I never remember other presidents being called Mr., though I could chalk it up to a poor memory. I thought proper usage was to always call him President, last name, or at least Mr. President. Okay, the president, yes, of course, in address is called Mr. President. But what you were talking about there is journalistic references Here, I would suggest that this is largely the result of old newspaper style, particularly the New York Times, which always uses Mr. and then last name in the article after one initial use of a person's title, like president, last name, etc. So they will say Mr. Obama in New York Times articles. And it's certainly no reflection on President Obama. It was the same a few years ago they would use Mr. Bush after in the beginning of the article saying President Bush. As goes the gray lady, so do a lot of journalists. So they will say Mr. Clinton, Mr. Reagan, and if referring to the rock star, Mr. Bowie. And as a sign, it's not a new thing. I cite an article from the New York Times, April 16th, 1861. The headline is, In Louisiana, Reception of President Lincoln's Proclamation. Then the first sentence, Mr. Lincoln's War Proclamation was received with no astonishment, etc., etc., etc. The Times was a supporter of Lincoln, yet they used the Mr. style. I suppose Mr. was a more formal title than it seems now, so it wasn't an insult in any way. And I guess it's just a matter of not wanting to repeat President, President, President over and over again. Clifford Gates writes, I live in the town that Admiral Yamamoto was born in, and it was bombed the last week of the war. Paradoxically, the town honors Yamamoto here as a heroic native son with a large statue of him. I'm often reminded that he was personally opposed to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Is that a reason to cut him some slack? Is there dirt on the guy, or is he deserving of admiration? Thanks, Cliff, for just some quick thoughts on this. It's not fair to say he opposed the Pearl Harbor attack, but that he had reservations about it. He carried out, uh, under instructions, the attack, and did everything he could to make it successful. He had expressed reservations prior to the attack that, look, if we do this, I'll have six months to a year where I'll run wild. But then we're going to have to win because the long-term war will be very difficult. We're going to have to go all the way to Washington in order to get this nation to surrender. So we don't know if he actually made the comment about Sleeping Giant. That could be somewhat of a legend, but it kind of summed up his feelings as expressed. I think the one thing positive you can definitely say about Yamamoto is 
he was opposed to the pact with the Axis powers, the pact with the Nazis. And he opposed that at some possible sacrifice to his career. He was ridiculed by his fellow officers. Um, It was only his great skill in naval operations that saved him. I think it's very common for any people like the Japanese to celebrate their military heroes. Uh, Obviously, this is not a a figure that's going to be a person that's going to be well-liked in the U.S., and the fact is, whether he was opposed to it or not, he did carry out the uh, Pearl Harbor attack. Kurt, at the same time, we were negotiating with the Japanese, I mean, so history doesn't look kindly on surprise attacks like that. It sounds like I'm telling some mythic tale, a city that sprung out out of nowhere next to a lake. Rows of similar houses in pastel colors, yellow, blue, light gray, with oversized garages on winding streets, every once in a while with a cul-de-sac or a man-made lake or golf course. You can order your own on the internet. It's called The Villages, and it's one of the most popular retirement communities in Florida now, in the central county of Sumter. And its influence could go all the way to the White House. Because part of the reason Florida gained two electoral votes in the 2012 election map is that Sumner had 24,000 people when Reagan was elected in 1980, and it has 93,000 today. Yet this is an old story. Florida has been gaining population for decades, since William Jennings Bryan bought some land there and started promoting the state in the 1920s. In Harry Truman's re-election, it had eight electoral votes to give him. Now, it has 29. It's still growing as coastal population moves inward, and people are still moving from the Northeast and Midwest to Palm Beach and Miami, though at slightly less rate than they were before. So California, meanwhile, grew from 25 electoral votes in the time of Harry Truman to 55 for the 2004 election. No surprise there as Easterners flooded west. Population came up from Mexico, and the city dwellers in California moved to western CA counties, spreading the state's population out. Plenty of room at the Hotel California. But in 2012, there was no gain. And the state has the same 55 votes to give as it did in 2004 which was only one vote more than it had in the 1992 election. All of this is relevant, as Dave Podner asks me, given demographic trends, how would the Electoral College change and which states would lose the most in 2024? (laughs) I really, I'll just try anything, I guess. Uh, I can talk generally about it. There's two things, though, that are not visible right now. One is the real impact of the recession, because, for instance, I don't know if Nevada's one electoral vote gain in 2012 if that was real or if they're going to lose that with the kind of unemployment they have there and the housing market that you have there uh, right now, which might cause some problems in that state. What's going to happen in the rest of this decade? We don't know. So we're making projections based on the 2010 and 2012 data that we have. But I will do it. And I think there are some trends you can see. The more shocking part to me about 2024, I think, will be that the pattern we've gotten used to won't happen as fast. We expect everyone to be going from the East to Florida and California, leaving New York, etc. I mean, that state, New York, wants 11% of all the electoral votes in the nation 200 years ago is now 5.3% of America's total election power. Ohio drops, Pennsylvania drops, Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Indiana. I would expect drops there to continue. The Northeast and Midwest will give votes to other states. But where those people, those voters, and those electoral votes go will be more diffuse than it has in the past. If you're an Ohioan tired of Cleveland or a Pennsylvanian tired of Philly, now in the 2010s, Are you dreaming about going to Southern California? Maybe, but not the same way you might have in the 70s or 80s. You might be thinking now about the traffic or the jobs, not just the nice palm trees. Instead, South Carolina, North Carolina, Utah, Colorado, and Texas are states that might beckon you. Texas gained four electoral votes in the 2012 election, and given its population centers, Fort Worth, Austin, the Mexican border, I would expect that state to continue to grow in 2024. That's a pretty easy call to make. I still see Florida pick up maybe one electoral vote because of the continued, albeit smaller, growth 
of retirees there and also younger families moving to that state. The area I would look at is the coastal south, both Carolinas, Virginia, Georgia. I think you'll see gains there. Washington State seems likely to continue to gain. Arizona, yes, if they continue to hold on to their population growth in the wake of some of the recent change in immigration laws there, uh, if they still have people moving in or if they're forced out or if they get scared out of the state, that might have an impact by the time you get to 2024. I also see growth in the West, the interior West, Colorado, Wyoming, I mentioned Utah, New Mexico. These are places that are likely to see another vote or two. None of it's shocking. Deep South continues to lose. You know, if you're not connected to that coast, Arkansas, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, Tennessee, to some extent, losing electoral votes. But I think the real shocker is going to be, and I'll make this prediction now, in 2024, California, for the first time in this nation's history, since it gave its first four electoral votes to Franklin Pierce for President of the United States, will lose an electoral vote. It will go backward. That's my prediction. It's great to make a prediction I don't have to get challenged on until 2024, but the trends seem to be there. You can't keep 55 electoral votes unless you continue to grow faster than the rest of the nation. I should make a note here. It is that uh, we really should look at this as something to be proud of. Uh, those of us listening who are to this program who are uh, United States citizens, uh, it's what makes the United States a great country. No state has a lock on people here. You can get in your car and drive and, with reasonably minimal interruptions, live somewhere else. This ability to travel is not something that we should take for granted. It's not the same everywhere else. There are legal problems, but also just cultural differences in other places that you know, don't make people as likely to travel as Americans. You take Europeans who are on a landmass that's actually smaller than the United States, much less likely to move. 2006 survey put out by the European Commission shows just 2% of EU citizens live in a country other than their own. They're trying to make this easier, and EU members do not lose their right of citizenship if they move to another country. Uh, They still have their EU citizenship, and they still have rights that come from that. They have the right to vote for the European Parliament and things like that. Can't be discriminated against because of their nationality. But it doesn't necessarily mean they have an instant right to work. And uh, for instance, they They could lose their unemployment benefits if they stay in a country other than their own for more than three months. So the 50 United States are one of the biggest free trade, free mobility zones on the planet. And it's not just that you can get in your Honda and drive to Utah and you can live there and set up without very little fuss. Of course, you got to get a job, but that's another problem. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. We do have a number of things there. There is the archive. Right now it's $14.99. I think it's an incredible deal because I have just about everything that we've uh, podcasted in the past since going back to 2006. So it's quite a bit of content for $14.99. It's not going to be that forever. We're developing various new programs, how we're going to slice and dice the archive, etc., and offer it in new ways. Some of you who listen to this podcast might also listen to Mike Duncan's very good History of Rome. I never thought of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics as a place to make shout-outs, but I would like to acknowledge the end of his podcast as he has reached the end of the Roman Empire. And also, uh, a child was born recently, so congratulations to him and uh, Podcast Unity. Gotta have it. If you do like the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics program, Please tell somebody about it, and thank you for listening.